recording this session. Guide ourselves through, but you know, I, I look at it over 34 years and say, how much better is it really? Okay. So when day, if you are speaking, please identify yourself and speak clearly. You may be asked to repeat your comments or questions if there's a delay or issue with the audio. That's never going to be good. Before we jump into the session today, I do want to take a moment to introduce the team here at the OPI who is helping support the ARP ESSER 3 um, initiative and the two plans and the funding and all of the pieces that go along with it. So uh, first, Jeff, would you like to say hello? Appreciate your insight. I'm concerned. You bet. My name is Jeff Kirksey. I am the uh, new uh, ESSER program manager here at OPI. Um, I will be working directly with you to field any of your ESSER related questions and work with you through the ESSER application and approval process. Mindy? Mindy, would you like to say hello? Hi, everyone. I'm Mindy Askison. I am the program analyst for the ESSERs and I worked with probably most of you about um, getting applications completed and stuff like that. And I will be here working directly with Jeff for any issues um, or questions you have about e-grants and the e-grants program and um, getting you where you need to be in that program. Thank you, Mindy. Tracy? Good morning, everyone. Tracy Moseman, Chief Program Officer here at the Office of Pro Public Instruction. I um, work with Julie and the um, department in overseeing um, and, and supporting the work of implementing the ESSER state plan. Thank you. David? Hi, uh, good morning. I'm Dave Williams. I'm uh, the Chief Financial Officer now uh, at OPI. and. Uh, we're pleased to uh, provide information that we can and guidance on uh, on ESSER funding. And uh, my colleagues and I are, are working diligently to uh, make give all that clarity that we can. And uh, we're here to serve. So thank you. Thanks, David. Chris? Hi, good morning, everyone. Chris Averill. I'm the communications director here at OPI. Uh, apologies if you get lots of emails from us. And um, I also update the website. So please continue to check the website as we update it with uh, information from today and, and future events. Thanks, Julie. And Jay. Good morning, everybody. It's Jay Phillips, uh, Senior Manager of Central Life Services. Um, it's my team that is uh, charged with the responsibility of um, administering the, the grants management system of how all the funding will be distributed. And then also um, houses the grant accountants that work with uh, the distribution and reimbursements of cash requests. And so we're here for any technical support that we can provide you guys through the process. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Um, and again, my name is Julie Mergel and I'm the Senior Manager of School Improvement and Innovation. So key dates um, that I wanna share with you before we kind of jump into our questions and just kind of high level is we are offering these Q&A sessions every Tuesday from 9.30 to 10.30 on the same Zoom link that we are on today. Um, and so those will be through the entire month of June. We will be hosting next week on the 15th an Ed Advocates monthly partnership meeting where we'll be debriefing the state plan that was submitted as well as providing up-to-date information about allowable uses of um, ARP ESSER, about construction uh, questions that are coming in, all of that key information as we move forward. And just a note for all of our budget people out there, June 16th is the final day to submit cash requests for the June payment for all federal programs, including ESSER 1. So that's just that kind of a friendly reminder from our budget folks here. Um, and then June uh, 24th to the 25th, we will be hosting a virtual Montana Education Summit to support districts with educational planning opportunities to really be thinking innovatively about ARP ESSER and to learn more details about just um, all of the pieces that are built within the, um, the plans and the information as we really address the impact of COVID-19. Um, 
um, and really begin to accelerate learning and come out strong on the other end. Um, July 1st is a really key date. That'll be the day when the window opens um, in Teams for the uh, district ARP ESSER plan template. Um, and so we'll be providing more information in these sessions and on our webpage leading up to when that actually opens um, and that template is available to um, our school districts. Um, then in the month of July, we're going to be um, hosting some ARP ESSER webinars um, again on Tuesdays from 9.30 to 10.30. We're going to be really shifting our focus there to helping districts with developing and um, answering questions about that district ARP ESSER plan and the template. This is uh, August 3rd through 5th is a unique session for our comprehensive schools um, who are identified under the ESSA accountability system. We're offering a regional summit where we'll be helping them come together uh, with their teams to do some uh, planning um, in real time uh, to support them with that ARP ESSER plan and to kind of merge all of these things together so that they can really be thinking about coordinated programming of all the uses of those federal dollars. And then on August 24th, the second really, I think, important key date is that's the day that the district ARP ESSER plans need to be submitted to the OPI. Um, we do want to note that uh, September 1st is the date to complete the ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 applications in the e-grants. So those will remain open up until then. And then after that, um, we'll, um, that will close and then uh, amendments will have to be made if there's any changes after September 1st. So just wanted to share with you really some, some key dates. Um, and then a little bit of information about ESSER oh, overall. Um, before we jump in, there's been three rounds of funding that have come in that we refer to as ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and ESSER 3. Um, the first ESSER 1 was the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, better known as CARES, that was released in March of 2020 for around $41 million. The second uh, flow of money came through the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act in December of 2020 for around 170 million. Uh, the last set of money that has arrived is referred to as the ARP, American Rescue Plan Act, uh, which was uh, March 20 of 21 for the first two thirds of the set of money for around 380 million. Uh, the, the remaining one third of funds will uh, be issued once the state plan uh, has been reviewed by the Department of Education and approved. And it has been submitted uh, for Montana yesterday. Um, there is one other piece there that I just wanna note is about the emergency assistant for non-public schools, better known as um, EANS. EANS, you guys, is um, unique. Um, in ESSER 1, public schools had to go through the equitable share process used in federal try to one funding to determine how much funding should go to non-public schools for the benefit of low-income children at these schools. But that changed. So in ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, the equitable share process was discontinued. In its place, Congress authorized EANS. Um, and so uh, there's a piece about there that is important to note that uh, the second flow of money, ESSER 2, there was 2.8 million to Montana for EANS and then 12.1 million under the American Rescue Plan. Uh, for this program, the OPI has set up a system whereby non-public schools can apply directly to the OPI for these funds. Um, and the allowable uses for these funds are similar to public schools. Um, in Montana, please do note that homeschool children are considered to be part of the non-school public school population. But I just wanted to share that with you. And then one other thing that you'll see out there is another set of funding, just to distinguish the difference between the two. That's the GEAR funding, known as the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund that was awarded to the governor to provide to LEAs and institutions of higher education and other educated related entities um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, please note that no GEAR funds uh, from the governor's office were awarded directly to LEAs. 
Um, so I just wanted to kind of just set the stage when we're talking and using all of these wonderful acronyms that really today we're focusing in on ESSER 3, known as the American Rescue Plan, ARP. So um, we'll kind of use those terms, but hopefully we can understand that um, in exchange of things. So before I go into key topics and kind of answer a couple of these questions, I did want to uh, share with you just some information about these. Uh, these there is a document that has been published by the department just recently here at the end of May that has ESSER and GEARS FAQs. Um, that is a really um, pretty thick document, uh, around 60 some pages that does have a lot of questions about that. And we in fact did draw some of our uh, frequently asked questions from that document. But that's a really good document that's been published by the department that really does outline the allowable uses of the ESSER funding. Um, we've also developed an FAQ document that we will be posting on the web page that does have information about ARP funding that kind of puts it in Montana terms, if you will. We've also posted on our web page um, an ESSER 3 guidance document that does outline a UABLE use. So there's some other places where you can go for information uh, beyond our session today. Um, and like I said, I will be following up with um, posting this slideshow that you can go ahead and take a look at this and the recording as well. I do wanna post a disclaimer that similar to the FAQ document that the US Department published on SRNEs, the contents of this session and the documents that we provide do not have the force or effect of law and are not meant to bind the public in any way. So this information is subject to change as additional information uh, does continue to get released by the department. So I've kind of set the stage here now. We're going to really jump into the heart of our session. So like, thank you for letting me lay the groundwork, if you would. So today, I'm just going to skip forward a couple more slides. Sorry about that. Just so I wanted to get that flow correctly. So key topics on the questions and answers that we're going to do in part one are really around these five areas, and they will go in this order. We're going to start with questions that are just basic requirements of ESSER 3. We're going to talk about allowable uses of the ESSER funds. We're going to be spending a good portion of time, if you will, on some of the frequently asked questions that we've got around construction and capital request. Then we will be spending the rest of the time on the two required plans that districts must submit, which is the safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of service plan, and then some questions and answers around the district ARP ESSER plan. So to kind of flow in this, so what we're going to do is we're going to share these questions with you. I'm going to read the question. Jeff is going to provide the response. And then we're going to open up to live questions that you might have. So I do encourage you again to put things in the chat uh, so that if you are have clarified clarifying questions about anything that we've shared in these five topics that we can answer them here in the second part of our session or any new questions that arise as well. So we're ready to go and jump in on officially Q&As. So the first question to you, Jeff, is what is the biggest difference between ESSER 1, 2, and 3 funds? Yeah. So ESSER 2 contains two planning requirements, which we will... Um, uh, which we will uh, uh, explain more in this Q&A today. It also includes a 20% a set aside for funding to be expended for lost instructional time type activities and has new maintenance of equity provisions. All right, Jeff, must the SEA submit a grant application to the OPI through the e-grant management system to receive ESSER 3 funds? The answer to that is yes, the LEA must submit the grant application to OPI by September 1st, uh, 2021. Uh, each LEA must also submit uh, by August 24th, uh, 2021, the district ARP ESSER plan uh, to uh, the OPI for approval. And we'll, like I said, we'll discuss that more. Uh, as a reminder, the plan and the budget are separate. So. Uh, the plan will be submitted a one way, the budget will be submitted through e-grants. Thank you, Jeff. Will LEAs and schools be monitored? Will there be a data collection? Yes, the OPI will monitor district implementation of ESSER 3 funds based on standard risk assessment procedures. So won't be anything uh, new there. 
uh, the LPI anticipates a data collection due to the uh, Department of Ed regarding state and local ESSER II expenditures. Will there be special reporting requirements for our ESSER III grants? Uh, uh, the Department of Ed hasn't yet released the reporting requirement, although uh, we should expect reporting uh, use of funds uh, from the Department of Ed as well as OPI or both. Where can LEAs find information about allowable uses for ESSER III? Yes, so um, uh, the reference for the elementary and secondary school emergency relief uh, funding guidance document located on the LPA website and the ESSER and GEAR FAQ uh, uh, produced by the uh, Department of Education. Those are both available on our website. Um, the ESSER and GEAR fund FAQ was developed by the Department of Education uh, and it provides an overview. It's an extensive document. It provides an overview of how funds can be used it emphasizes what the ESSER resources are available for a wide range of activities to address diverse needs arising from, uh, from and uh, or exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and to emerge a strong post-pandemic uh, recovery. So uh, just a reminder there, uh, as is the case with all activities charged to ESSER, costs must be reasonable and necessary to meet overall purpose and program, which is to prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID-19. And you can actually uh, see the federal uh, guidance there. Thank you, Jeff. Are the ARP ESSER three funds required to be used for specific uses? Yes. Uh, so the LEAs must expend a minimum of 20% of their allocation uh, on evidence-based interventions such as summer learning, extended day comprehensive after-school programs or extended uh, school year programs and ensure interventions respond to students' academic, social and emotional needs and address disproportionate impact of the coronavirus on populations as on special populations identified uh, as defined by uh, ESSA in Title I Part. Thank you, Jeff. How do you determine if an activity is allowable use of funds? Yeah, so generally um, determining whether an activity is allowable, um, uh, you can use kind of these three uh, uh, items to kind of think through in your mind. Uh, is the use of funds intended to prevent, prepare for, or respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, including its impact on, on social, emotional, mental health, and academic needs of students? Does the use of funds fall under one of the authorized uses of ESSER funds? And is the uh, use of funds permissible under the uniform administrative requirements, cost principles, and audit requirements for federal awards? This is commonly known as the uniform guidance. Uh, in particular, it's necessary, is the expense necessary and reasonable uh, for the performance of the uh, ESSER or GEAR award. Are there recommended uses of ESSER three funds that will assist LEAs to address the impact of the COVID pandemic and disruptions leading to lost instructional time? Yeah, because our educational landscape is so diverse in the state of Montana, really the LEA should use their local data, conduct, conduct uh, gap analysis and comprehensive needs assessment uh, processes to determine the best uses of funds for their students and staff. Um, you can certainly, we certainly encourage an interdistrict dialogue to, uh, to understand how various districts are using their funds. All right, Jeff, can an LEA just use two thirds of the ARP ESSER three funds that have been released by the department and not apply for the remaining one third and not complete the reopening plan or the district ARP ESSER plan? As much as some would like the answer is no. Um, the requirements for ARP ESSER funds require that the LEA provide uh, both of those plans. Failure to do so could result in return of those funds by the LEA. All right, how about that 20%? Can an LEA leave the 20% on the table? 
and just use the 80% of the allocation instead? No, 20% uh, of an LEA's total expenditures must be expended for evidence-based activities to address loss of instructional time for the LEA uh, will not be, uh, or the LEA will not be compliant. Jeff, are there strings attached to these funds? Yes, including safe return to in-person uh, to be updated every, uh, those plans to be updated every six months, the LEA plan to be updated every six months, including data collection and monitoring for the use of funds. In addition, uh, there is that 20% set aside for specific use, which we just discussed. Jeff, can districts innovate on the use of funds? Please. Uh, yes, it is strongly encouraged that districts use these unprecedented funding allegations to innovate and implement uh, the improvements that have been uh, aspirations for our students. Are agencies that provide out of school time or other general support to LEAs able to apply for ESSER three funds? No, uh, not through this mechanism. Um, organizations that the LE, LEAs are, uh, sorry, organizations other than LEAs are not eligible uh, for the formula F, uh, ESSER three funding. Organizations who can provide eligible services to LEAs uh, would reach out to those LEAs to identify if their services meet the LEAs identified needs. All right, Jeff, take a stretch because now this is about many of the questions that you've been receiving. We're transitioning from allowable uses to construction. Yes. Um, so what is the guidance on construction costs? Yeah, so there is, there is quite a bit uh, and that can be found. Uh, it's actually on pages 25 and 26 of the ESSER and GAIR FAQ uh, that can be found on the LPI website, but we'll dig into some of them now. So. so is construction allowable under ARP ESSER? It is. Uh, construction is authorized under uh, Title Seven of uh, uh, ESSA, ESSA um, and therefore, is uh, allowable use under GEARS and ESSER funds uh, under these various uh, sections uh, the, in, the, in, in these various acts. <laughs> so I won't read them all for you, but the broad impact aid definition of construction includes new construction as well as remodel remodeling, alterations, renovations, and repairs under which many activities related to COVID-19 would likely fall. However, the department discourages the uh, LEAs uh, from using ESSER and GEAR funds for new construction. Uh, this use of funds may limit the LEA's ability to support other essential needs or in innovations. Remodeling, uh, renovations, and new construction are often time consuming, which may not be workable under the shorter timelines associated with ESSER and GEAR funds. These types uh, of activities Sorry, the chat box came up and blocked my view. Um, <laughs> these types of activities are also subject to several uh, additional federal requirements as detailed below. All right, Jeff. So what really is the federal definition for construction? Okay, the Impact Aid Program statute defines construction as a, the preparation of drawings and specifications for school facilities, B, erecting, building, acquiring, altering, remodeling, repairing, or extending school facilities, C, inspecting and supervising the construction of school facilities, and D, debt services for such activities. As is the case with all construction contracts using laborers and uh, mechanics financed by federal education funds, the LEA, uh, an LEA that uses GEAR or ESSER funds for minor a minor remodeling renovations, pairs, and construction contracts over $2,000 must meet all Davis-Bacon prevailing wage requirements. Jeff, who determines if a construction project is an allowable use of funds? Yes. Um, one second. I'm having some screen issues. Hang on, two, two shakes. Okay, so while construction is generally allowable, it is 
the responsibility of the governor, SEA, LEA, or other subgrantee to assure that uh, the individual costs comply with the cost principles in uh, uh, 2 CFR Part 200, Subpart E, um, uh, meet the overall purposes of the CARES, CARISA, and ARP Act programs, which is to prevent, prepare, for or respond to COVID-19 and are consistent with the proper and efficient administration of these programs. Please note that under these general principles, any construction activities, including renovations or remodeling that are necessary for an LEA uh, to prevent, prepare for and respond to COVID-19 could be permissible. Though the burden remains on grantees and subgrantees to maintain the appropriate documentation documentation that reports uh, that supports these expenditures. How does an LEA request pre-approval of construction cost from the OPI? Yes, so the ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 e-grants model were designed to allow construction projects to be entered for pre-approval. I will note that this is new. Uh, so those of you that have already submitted um, ESSER 2 uh, funding programs, uh, which I am reviewing, uh, if if you get a rejection and uh, asking for pre-approval, I will uh, copy the link to that form that you can actually complete that there. So, um, and then I can review that and, and grant you pre-approval. Um, uh, for those of you who haven't done that yet, it will actually be on your uh, equipment and, uh, uh, oh, Mindy, what's the name of the tab? <laughs> It's the 700 item, <laughs> items that meet the 700 um, definition. So the application uh, submitted to the LED in e-grants requires sufficient detail that would allow the OPI to pre-approve projects. Uh, should assurances be required uh, to specific federal con construction guidelines identified by the US Department of Education, uh, May 26, 2021 FAQ, I will reach out to you and uh, and we'll get that squared away. Jeff, I'm sorry, I couldn't get my um, unmute button on, but it's under um, property and equipment Thank on, uh, which is one of the tabs under the budget summary. Right, right. So thanks, Mindy. <laughs> we, just, we just put that live, so. <laughs> So Jeff, we have noted above, what are the federal requirements for approved construction projects? Yeah, so approved construction projects like these listed here must comply with the uh, applicable uniform guidance requirements, Davis-Bacon for failing wages, and all the department's uh, applicable regulations regarding construction. And you will see those are the 34 uh, CFR 76, 600s as well as the 75, 600 through 618. Some of the relevant parts uh, of the 75 requirements that must be considered before a new construction project is, in, uh, is initiated include, uh, has the grantee completed an environmental impact assessment before initiating the construction and fully considered any potential environmental ramifications before proceeding with the project? Uh, can, uh, has the grantee considered uh, the probable effects of proposed construction on any district site, building, or structure that is included or eligible for inclusion in the National Registry of Historic Places? Does the grantee have the title or other interest in the site, including the right of access, that is sufficient to ensure that the grantee will have use and possession of the facility for 50 years, or the useful life of the facility, whichever is longer. Can the grantee begin uh, the approved construction in a reasonable time period and have the final plans been approved before the construction is advertised or placed on the market for bidding? Can the grantee complete the project in a reasonable time and consistent with the approved plans and specifications? Is the construction functional, economical, not elaborate in design or extravagant in the use of materials as compared to other facilities in the state or other uh, applicable geographic areas? 
does the grantee uh, plans, uh, designs for the facilities comply with applicable federal, state, and local health and safety standards, as well as federal requirements regarding access by persons with disabilities? And does the grantee have sufficient operational funds to operate and maintain the facility once the construction is complete? And will the grantee operate and maintain the facility per all applicable applicable federal, state, and local requirements. Whew, all right. Finally, is ESSER and GEAR funds uh, used for construction, grantees and subgrantees should also be aware that, uh, that real property and equipment acquired or improved under a federal award must be appropriately insured and grantees must consult with the department on disposition instructions if the property or equipment is no longer needed. All right, Jeff, I know that was some really dense information and I know that's a, a lot to absorb, if you will. So I just wanna get to some straight questions on construction. Right. Can our BESSER funds be used for new construction? <laughs> yes, uh, provided that the pre-approval and all the federal guidelines are met in the project and the new construction meets the primary purposes of ESSER. Can our BESSER funds be used for renovations? Yes, provided that the renovations meet the primary purpose of the ESSER funding. So prepare, prevent, respond to COVID-19. Can the deferred maintenance of a district be paid with the ESSER funds? This one's trickier, uh, and we're gonna get some follow-up guidance from the department ed, ed on this. Uh, no, uh, and, and specifically, ESSER funds can't, are not allowable for expenditures in, incurred on or, sorry, no. An ESSER can, <laughs> I'll start over. No, an LEA may only use ESSER funds for any allowable expenditures incurred on or after March 13th, uh, 2020. So uh, we did ask that uh, question of the Fed. Uh, we're gonna do a follow-up, uh, but currently that's where it stands. Can fund be, funds be used to purchase trailers or modular buildings? Yes, provided that the renovations meet the primary purposes of ESSER funding, you'll hear this one a lot, prepare, pre prevent, or respond to COVID-19. Uh, also note uh, that the U.S. Department of Education cautions districts when purchasing modular to ensure that the civil rights of all, all children are met. We're talking about accessibility issues there. All right, we are done with that section and we just have two sections to go so that we can open up for live questions. So in terms of the return to in-person instruction and continuity of service plan, what is required in the plan? Yeah, so the LEAs must include how it will maintain the health and safety of students, educators and other school and LEA staff to the extent to which it has adopted policies and a description of any such policies on each of the CDC's safety recommendations. The plan must also describe how the LEA will ensure continuity of service, including but not limited to service to address students' academic needs and students and staff's social, emotional, mental health and other needs, which may include student health and food services. Is it a requirement for a district to adopt CDC guidance as a part of the development of the return to in-person instruction and continuity of services plan? Uh, the answer is no. The interim final rule clarifies that uh, the requirement must not mandate that an LEA adopt the CDC guidance, but only requires that the LEA uh, describe its plan to the extent in which the adopt, it has adopted the key prevention and mitigation strategies identified in the guidance. Is a return to in-person instruction and continuity of service plan required for all LEAs, even those who have already returned to in-person instruction? Yes, uh, LEAs are required to develop a plan or update an existing plan for the safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services uh, consistent with statuary. That's what you'd get when you try to read two words at once, consistent with 
statutory requirements of the ARP Act and the IFR. If an LEA has already returned to school, uh, its students do 100% full-time in-person instruction, it may plan, it, its plan should focus on its current and future activities to keep students and staff safe and ensure continuity of service. Note that LEAs may utilize uh, previously developed plans, the governor's plan uh, from uh, spring of 2020, or the template provided by Montpec. Uh, uh, these, <clears throat> as long as they add, address the return to in-person instruction, uh, and if the plan was approved by the local school board and allowed for public comment at the board meeting. Is a return to in-person instruction and continuity service plan required of all LEAs? This is a continued part of yep. that first question. Sure, sure. Yep, the OP, uh, the, so we, OPI, <laughs> have also recommended uh, that LEAs build on existing plans. Uh, LEAs likely have plans that address many of the elements of the federal requirements. This may include health and safety plans developed in collaboration with local departments of health, uh, LEAs may have existing uh, remote learning plans, uh, reopening plans submitted to the governor uh, in the spring of 2020, uh, continuous improvement plans, or other strategic plans that encompass aspects of these requirements. Districts should consider using these previously developed plans to meet requ uh, relevant requirements for the federal assurances and add additional elements as necessary to meet the federal expectations. How often does the plan need to be revised? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the plan uh, must be updated no less than every six months uh, until September 30th of 2023 and must include stakeholder input and public comment when revisions are necessary. Um, if an LEA already has a plan in place that doesn't meet the new requirements, it must revise the plan within six months. If the LEA revises its plan, the revised plan must address each of the aspects of safety currently recommended by the CDC at the time of the revision, or if the CDC has updated its safety recommendations at the time the LEA is revisiting the plan, each of the updated, uh, each of the updated safety recommendations. All right, Jeff, so that's some information, but when and where does this plan need to be developed and made publicly available? Yeah, so ESSER 3 requires LEAs to submit a plan to return to in-person instruction, gather public comment on the plan, and post it to the district or school's public webpage within, within 30 days of receiving ESSER 3 funds. This will require LEAs to post their return to in-person instruction plans within 30 days of receiving their ESSER 3 awards. In Montana, districts were awarded funds on May 24th, 2021. Thus, um, uh, the return to in-person instruction continuity of service plans need to be posted no later than June 24th, uh, 2021. Uh, each LEA will be uh, required to submit the website address uh, that links directly to the plan to OPI through uh, the ESSER 3 e-grants application. Are there requirements for how the return to in-person instruction and continuity of service plans are published? Yes, all plans must be understandable and, and uh, uniform for a format to the extent practicable, written in a language that parents can understand or if not practicable, orally translated for non-English speakers and upon request by a parent who is, who is an individual with a disability provide, uh, provided in an alternative format accessible to that parent. Jeff, what if you don't have a district website to upload this plan? Yeah, email me and we will work on an alternative me <laughs> method. All right, Jeff. What is the minimum an LEA is required to do to re-meet the requirements for stakeholder input on the return to in-person instruction and continuity of services plan? Yeah, the LEA must determine if their stakeholder input meets the minimum, require, uh, minimum 
<laughs> minimum requirements required in both statute uh, and federal rule. The LAA must engage in meaningful consultation with stakeholders and give the public an opportunity to provide input in the development of its plan for the uses of ARP ESSER III funds. Specifically, the LAA must engage in meaningful consultation with students, families, school and district administrators, including special education administrators, and teachers, principals, school leaders, other educators, school staff, and to the extent uh, present in or served by the LEAs, tribes, civil rights organizations, and stakeholder, uh, stakeholders representing the interests of children with disabilities, English language learners, children's experiencing homelessness, children in foster care, um, migrant students, children who are incarcerated, and other underserved students. Okay, so Jeff, does meaningful consultation require the LEA to include all of those subgroups you just listed? Yes, to the fullest extent possible. <laughs> what are recommended best practices then for an LEA to meet these stakeholder input requirements? Yeah, so best practice might include a community-wide public notice and comment process uh, with an optional survey to gather input from various required stakeholder groups. School board meetings, small group meetings, or public forums would also supplement uh, the process. Regardless of the process followed, the LEA must document that all the applicable stakeholder groups were included in the process and uh, that meaningful consultation occurred. Documentation of all plans and public comments need to be saved locally as OPI may request uh, the documents as part of compliance monitoring on ESSER grantees. Uh, just note public comment should be sought in a manner that is consistent with your existing local procedures. Does the OPI need to approve these plans? Uh, when LEA su uh, submit the e-grant application uh, to OPI the ESSER uh, for ESSER three funding, it will include an assurance that the LEA will have had will have a safe return to in-person instruction and uh, continuity of service plan posted on its website by June 24th. The assurance also requires LEAs to periodically review the plan with its stakeholders. In addition uh, to the requirement uh, that LEAs publicly post the continuity of service plan. The OPI will collect the website addresses for those plans through uh, the e-grant application and post them to the OPI website. So Jeff, what you're telling me is if districts follow the assurances and uh, gather input and publicly post them, the OPI is just requesting that they share that URL with us. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. All right, so the last section, and we're getting down to the end here. This is for the second set of plans so for the district ARP ESSER plan. So what's required in the district ARP ESSER plan? Yeah, the requirements for the district ARP ESSER plan must include a minimum, the extent to which and how funds will be used by the district to impl uh, implement uh, prevention and mitigate mitigation strategies how the district will use the mandatory 20% set aside uh, uh, to address the academic impact of lost instructional time through the implementation of evidence-based intervention, and how the district will use the remaining ARP ESSER funds consistent with statutory requirements, <laughs> um, and how the district will ensure that the ARP ESSER fund uh, Interventions, including but not limited to the 20% set aside, will respond to the academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs of all students, and particularly those students disproportionately impacted, and uh, consultation with uh, a wide variety of stakeholders when developing the plan. Uh, the LEA uh, ARP ESSER plan should be clear in a uniform format and available to all uh, which may require written or oral translation of non, for non-English speakers or uh, provide the documentation in, a, in an accessible format for individuals with disabilities. And it should also be available on the LEA's website. Will the district ARP ESSER plan be a PDF document emailed to the OPI? No, 
uh, LEAs must submit the uh, ARP ESSER plan to uh, the OPI through, uh, uh, through the Terms of Employment Accreditation and Master Schedule teams. Uh, the District ARP uh, ESSER plan uh, template will open uh, July 1st and close on August 24th in Teams. Uh, the OPI will continue to release information uh, on the OPI website under the ESSER information page so that LEAs can begin work in anticipation of the opening of the template in Teams. Can an LEA submit a base ARP ESSER plan and amend it later as it continues to work through the best approach and gather community input? No, uh, in order to meet the required plan timeline, August 24th, 2021, the LEA uh, may submit a preliminary plan and update it as needed as it receives more stakeholder input. Will more guidance be provided from the OPI on developing these district ARP ESSER plans? Yes, uh, the OPI has uh, planned three types of support for LEAs. Uh, Superintendent Artson is uh, hosting the, the Virtual Montana Education Summit uh, to support districts with educational planning opportunities. The work sessions uh, include developing our ESSER LEA plans, meaningful stakeholder consultation, data usage, uh, uh, refining uh, the purpose of K-12 education, and uh, reimagining state assessment. Uh, the session is a two-day event, event on June 24th and 25th. Registration is required and open at this link. Uh, OPI will also host more of these weekly Q&A sessions during the month of June to address questions related to our ESSER district plans and budgets. Uh, the session days will be June 8th, that's today, and the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th and they'll be from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. And uh, to the extent possible, please submit your questions to me, jeffrey.kirksey at montana.gov, um, by the close of business each Friday. Submitted questions will be addressed during the session each Tuesday at 9.30 a.m. Uh, the weekly Q&A uh, sessions will be held through Zoom. The link and dial information number will be the same every week. And finally, uh, the OPI will host uh, three APR ESSER webinar, ARP, sorry, ARP ESSER webinars during the month of July uh, to, assist, uh, uh, to assist in developing uh, and submitting uh, district ARP ESSER plans. The webinar will be recorded and posted for future viewing on the OPI webpage. The webinars will be on July 13th. Uh, July 20th and the 27th, also from 9.30 to 10.30 a.m. The ARP ESSER webinars uh, will be held through Zoom and the link and dial number will be the same every week. Additional Q&A sessions and technical assistant webinars will be conducted as needed. All right, Jeff, that was a lot of questions and answers that we've been receiving and um, a lot of information to share. Uh, so I do wanna take us to the chat where we do have a couple of questions posted and open the floor to any questions that folks from the um, session would like to ask. Uh, so looking at the chat, the first question we have here, Jeff, is about um, that June 16th date that we mentioned um, about submitting payments for the month of June before um, it closes um, for federal funding such as ESSER 1. Did you wanna say something about that? Yeah, you bet. So um, we had, we're actually, we're actually going to extend that deadline to the 18th. And part of the reason for that is we have, I am working through a number of ESSER 2 uh, applications right now. And I know a number of uh, those of you out there would really like access to those ESSER 2 funds for the present fiscal year. And so uh, I'm setting a goal to um, uh, have those applications reviewed uh, by June 15th. Uh, so that way you have your response. Um, and uh, even if you need to make some changes, you have time to make any amendments or changes uh, so that you can get in uh, your cash request by, uh, by June 18th. 
So we'll, and right. we'll update that date on all of our timelines. Thanks, Jeff. This is a question from Lance Boyd in Great Falls. When will the ESSER two grants be reviewed and approved or sent back with feedback? We have multiple level of summer student learning and re-engagement plans attached and need a little guidance. Yeah, yeah. So I am actually doing that now. Um, and so I'm right in the middle of that. I am taking those in the order that they were received, uh, but I hope to be entirely caught up by the 15th of June. So, um, and if there's any uh, if there's any piece that I have a, a question on, um, uh, just know that if if there is a piece I have a question on and I reject your fund, it is not an outright rejection. It just means uh, please read the comments on the rejection because it's typically I'm just asking for uh, either for pre-approval for capital expenditures or there's just something I need you to tweak or uh, further elaborate on in your plan. But it's usually something that's a pretty quick uh, quick item to address. Uh, then you can resubmit that plan and we can get it rolling. Uh, Rachel, you asked if we could drop the link for the uh, 24th and 25th uh, Montana edX uh, virtual conference in the chat box. And <clears throat> thank you. Chris has posted it there for you. So you will see the link in there. And also thank you to Cole for providing some um, links to some important documents around what are evidence-based practices. We have a course on evidence-based practices on the Learning Hub if you need more information on that. And then there's a really superb document about um, planning for summer and learning enrichment. Um, I think that document is really worth uh, taking a look at. That link is also provided it in there. So Jeff, we have a question from Hannah. She said, I believe Jeff mentioned that there was a new screener module that just went live in the project and equipment tab on the ESSER 2 consolidated application. If I understood this correctly, those of us who previously submitted an application that included construction repair projects, we need to go in and amend our previous application. Is that correct? I submitted an application on May 18th which included this type of project, but have received no feedback yet. Right, right. And part of the reason you haven't received feedback yet is because two weeks ago, we got the new guidance from the federal government outlining what they really want from us in our pre-approval process. So then we had to go out and build our pre-approval process. So, uh, so that's why there hasn't been movement on ESSER two funds is because we needed to address that pre-approval uh, question. We have that form. It is live. Um, and actually, if you go into eGrants and if you go to that tab and fill out and uh, fill out that it's a it's a Google form. If you just fill that out and submit it, you don't have to do anything else in eGrants. Um, I will look at uh, they I will look at your pre approval form. I will communicate to you uh, whether that whether whether you've received pre approval or if I need anything further. Um, and then once that pre-approval is uh, taken care of, then I'll go in uh, and finish the review uh, of your ESSER II grant. Jeff, um, this is Mindy. I just want to clarify, um, the link is not live yet. It takes 48 hours for it to get put into the application, but it will be live uh, at the latest by the end of this week. Yeah, yeah. And if, you, if it's something you really want to do today, uh, shoot me an email and I'll send you the direct link um, <laughs> so that you can do it that way. Um, so uh, otherwise, in about 40 hour, 48 hours, it will be uh, on that tab in your eGrants application. Thank you, Jeff. Those are the questions that we have in the chat. I do want to open the floor up to anybody um, out there who has a question that they'd ask that they would like to ask us um, here. All right, just um, so that you know where all of this information is located, when you go to the main OPI webpage at opi.mt.gov, you will see this landing page here. And there is a blue button um, that says find ESSER information. If you click on that, that is where all of this information is located. 
In fact, it's where we're going to be posting this recording and these uh, slides and where our FAQ will be located there that we will be continually updating as new information comes in and these questions get added. Um, and uh, that's kind of more information about like uh, the webinars. We're going to be providing some, you know, helpful tools, information about what that uh, template's going to look like for the ARP ESSER. All can be found right here, if you will, at the Find ESSER information. Um, in terms of next uh, steps for us, we, like I said, will be updating that frequently asked questions sheet for us and posting it on the OPI webpage so that it stays um, in live, up to date, document as much as possible. If uh, you can and do have questions, um, please do send them to Jeff, preferably by Friday of close of business so that we can be sure we have them addressed in our slideshow presentation on the next session Tuesday at 930. Please know that we won't have the same repeat. It'll be a new session based on new questions that we get um, or new information. I know that we'll be talking a little bit next week, uh, potentially about, um, you know, staff uh, stipends and that kind of information. So uh, please know that these will not be a repeat. So if you want to join us again, uh, please do. Um, and again, they will be at the same Zoom link and the same dial um, in information every week. Um, I just want to thank you uh, again for joining us here uh, today to be able to answer any questions that you might have. Um, we uh, really want to support you the best that we can. I want to honor the local control, want to be sure that you have resources and connections to all of our partners to, as we go through this work together and recognize that there's a lot of requirements and a lot of information to get through. Um, and so uh, thank you guys. And I just, you know, thank you for all of the hard work that each of you have done this school year. It's been a, a quite the year and um, our, this was so exciting to see all the graduations and all the ceremonies, um, I think a specialness this year in particular, as we think about what we've been through. So we realize this is coming um, after a really hard year. And so we wanna support you in any and every way that we can. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Jeff. Like he said, he's got that link available as well. Um, so um, anything that we can do to get that out to you and in information, um, please let us know. That's all that I have for you today. Um, again, thank you, and I'll stay on the line if anybody wants to remain back um, to have any um, particular individual questions that they want to ask. Thanks again. Have a great day.